live. As we hear these words, may we hold the same confidence and hope as the writer that God hears our cries and one day, either in heaven or on earth, we will be healed. The psalmist writes, Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you, so that you may be revered. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning, more than those who watch for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is great power to redeem. It is he who will redeem Israel from all its iniquities. God's holy wisdom, God's holy word. Time to spend a moment with our young people. Come on, Weston. There you go. All right. I have something in my bottle. What do you think it is? Use your imagination. What's it? Water? What else could it be? It could be vinegar. Got any other ideas? I was thinking maybe it could be something like Sprite. Hmm. Maybe bubbles. Yeah, it could be bubbles. Oh, if it was Sprite, there would be bubbles. Yeah, you're pretty smart on that one. Yeah, that's a good idea. Anybody out there have any guesses what's in my bottle? Perfume. It could be perfume. Contact solution. That's a good one. That's a good one. All right, you ready? No. It says tears. You know, in the Bible, there's a king, and his name was David. And he says that God gathers all our tears in a bottle. Could be a lot. You never know. Yeah, seems like a lot, doesn't it? Could be. Peyton says, no. Weston says, yeah, I say maybe. But you know what? What kind of tears do we cry? When do we cry? When we're sad? When we're happy? So that's kind of neat that God gathers all our tears and holds them special for us. Well, today I'm going to read you a story, and it's a crazy one. You learned about it in Club Luke, about a guy who was Jesus' what? BFF. His BFF, his best friend forever. You're right. And his name was Lazarus, and Lazarus dies. What kind of tears do they cry? Sad tears, right? Now think of all the people that were crying. And even Jesus, when he gets to where Lazarus is in his grave, we have the shortest verse in the Bible. And it's two words, Jesus cried. Even Jesus cried. And so then he decided he did to, wanted to do something pretty amazing. Do you remember what it was? He brought Lazarus back to life. Yes, he brought Lazarus back to life. Man, you listened to Club Luke, didn't you? And then there were what kind of tears? If we had happy, sad tears when he died, what kind of tears do we have now? Mad? Tears. Mad? Well, not really, but if, if Lazarus is back alive, happy tears. And God gathers them all. And that's so God can say, you know what, Peyton? You know what, Weston? I love you so much that when you're happy or when you're sad, I'm going to hold on to your tears for you. And when I hold on to your tears, that means I'm holding on to you too. So when you're happy or sad, just remember that God is always with us, okay? All right, how about we all pray today, together? Dear God, 
thank you, thank you. for keeping our tears for keeping our tears safe with you, safe with you. and for being with us and being with us no matter what no matter what and all God's children said amen, amen. all right Jesus, thy boundless love to me, no thought can reach, no tongue declare, unite my thankful heart to thee, and reign without a rival there, thine holy Thou alone by 
How many of you are familiar with the story of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead? Good. That's good to know. We're going to start today, oh, about halfway through the story. So I'm going to give you a little background. Jesus and his disciples have been about 40 miles from where Lazarus lives. So it's a hefty walk. And he gets news up there that Lazarus is sick. And Mary and Martha are asking him to come back. But weirdly, he says no. And the disciples are worried about him going back there because the Jewish leaders are pu putting together a plot to kill him. So that makes it, throws in a little bit more into the mix. And finally, Jesus says no. Now, Lazarus isn't sick, but he's dead. Now I'm going to go back. Jesus does things in his own time. How often have we asked Jesus for something and wanted it instantaneously, only to find out later that maybe that wasn't the best timing? And so where we gather into the story today is under Jesus' timing. Four days has passed since Lazarus has died, and we're coming into the story as Jesus gets to Bethany and meets with the family. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Many Jews had come to comfort Martha and Mary after their brother's death. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him, while Mary remained in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Even now I know that whatever you ask God, God will give to you. Jesus told her, your brother will rise again. Martha replied, I know that he will rise in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will live even though they die. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Martha, do you believe this? She replied, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, God's son, the one who's coming into the world. After she said this, she went and spoke privately to her sister Mary. The teacher is here and he's calling for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to Jesus. He hadn't entered the village but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were comforting Mary in the house saw her get up quickly and leave, they followed her, assuming she was going to the tomb to mourn. When Mary arrived where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at her, his feet and said, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. When Jesus saw her crying and the Jews who'd come with her crying also, he was deeply disturbed and troubled. Where have you laid him? They replied, Lord, come and see. Jesus cried. The Jews said, see how much he loved him? But some of them said, he healed the eyes of the blind man. Couldn't he help Lazarus from dying? Jesus was deeply disturbed when he came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone covered the entrance. Jesus said, remove the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said, Lord... The smell will be awful. He's been dead for four days. Jesus replied, didn't I tell you that if you believed, you would see God's glory? So they removed the stone. Jesus looked up and said, Father, thank you for hearing me. I know you always hear me. I say this for the benefit of the crowd standing here so that they will believe that you sent me. Having said this, Jesus shouted with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his feet bound, his hands tied, and his face covered with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, untie him and let him go. Brothers and sisters, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord endures forever. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God.
It's the question you ask when you're at the end of our rope, when the storm is raging and the monsters under the bed introduce themselves, when everything else around us seems to be on fire. It's the question we ask when hope slips through like sand in a bottle and the mockingbirds stop their singing when the news reporter leads with yet another mass shooting. It's the question we ask when depression moves in, making himself a home, making a mess of it all. It's the question we ask when we're not sure if Easter will come. Will Lent be forever? Will the sun ever shine? Will hope lead to something? Can these bones live? Those are the words of Reverend Sarah Speed in the poem she wrote for our seeking devotion this week, reflecting upon this week's question, can these bones live? Now this question isn't about finding eternal life after death. It's about finding hope in the seemingly hopeless situations of our lives. Situations that make us feel like we're dead inside and our bones are parched and thirsting for any kind of hope to make us want to live. I'm sure most of us have been there. You know, hope seems to be a fleeting thought these days. Every day we are bombard bombarded with news about wars and natural disasters and violence and abuse and oppression and human trafficking and so much more, and it just sucks the life out of us. I mean, if hopelessness, fear, and anxiety were energy sources, we would power the world indefinitely. But if the world was powered by hope, I can't help but wonder if we would live in a perpetual state of dusk and darkness. A darkness that finds and enjoys death. Dead. Dead. It's a word that as a pastor, I have learned that most people like to shy away from saying. After all, I'll agree, it does have a certain finality to it. You know, we are so afraid of saying that somebody is dead that we have desensitized the word by saying things like, the person passed away, they checked out, they were called home, they gave up the goat, they're pushing up daisies or they ain't going to go shop at Walmart anymore. That's why today's question, can these bones live, is so important for us to explore. And it's even more fun to explore when we do it through a story, like of new life being breathed into a guy named Lazarus, but also into his family and his community. Now, every time I study this scripture, I always wonder, what would Steven Spielberg do with this story? How would he turn it into a movie? I mean, I'm sure he'd have great actors such as Tom Hanks or Denzel Washington or Meryl Streep or Viola Davis. And of course, we all know it would have the most incredible special effects, right? So when the story opens, we learn that Lazarus, a BFF to Jesus, and the disciples has fallen asleep. In other words, he's croaked. Isn't it interesting that even the first century Jews have a euphemism for the word dead? For they use sleep quite often. Anyway, Lazarus has kicked the bucket, and Jesus has been summoned by his sisters, Mary and Martha, to come to their home. They need the love and empathy and support and compassion that only their BFF Jesus can supply. Now, little do they know, they will receive all that and a whole lot more, just not in the way they expect it to happen. 
For Jesus is not only going to wake up their death sleeping brother, but he's going to wake up the entire community to a new thing called resurrection power. The story plays out just like a Hollywood blockbuster. When Jesus gets to the scene, Lazarus has been dead for four days, and let's just say the stinky smell of death is pervasive. So when he arrives, the wake is in full swing with food and music and mourners all around. And rather than immediately going to the crowd, he takes the time to be with both Mary and Martha one-on-one in a private moment. And it is when he is alone with Martha that we get those incredible words we so often hear at funerals. I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives believing in me will never die. Kind of gives you chill bumps because we know the end of the story, right? As Jesus reaches Lazarus' tomb, the reality of the pain that he sees on the people he loves so much hits him. And he begins to weep with compassion and empathy for them. It's it's a touching and beautiful scene. But alas, that intimacy isn't going to last. As some rude onlooker looks at his buddy and says, well, you think he could have done something from keeping the poor dude from dying? Now is the time for Jesus to get to work. And he stops at nothing short of resurrection power. So ordering the stone to be rolled away from the entrance, Jesus lifts his hands and eyes to heaven, which is a typical Jewish prayer posture. And he gives a beautiful prayer of thanksgiving. And then with a loud holy breath, he shouts into the darkness of the tomb, Lazarus, come out. First, there is the groan, and then there's shuffling of footsteps, and out from the darkness lurches Lazarus, still bound in smelly linens. Don't you wish you could have seen the faces of Mary and Martha in the community when Lazarus became a dead man walking? I'm sure there was at least a moment of stunned silence before tears, once so filled with grief, turned to shrieks of joy. I mean, imagine even more, poor Lazarus. You've just beat Lazarus, you've just awakened, and you're standing outside your own tomb, wrapped in linens meant to mummify you, and you're looking at a stunned crowd of people who don't know whether to laugh, cry, or run screaming to the hills. I mean, I can't imagine what it was like for Lazarus to wake back up to life after life after death. I mean, if you think about it, Lazarus dies once, but he's born twice. Once from the womb, once from the tomb. Proving that with Jesus, these bones can live. I often wondered what happened and what life was like for Lazarus after that day. Scripture really doesn't give us any more information about him, except that he went on to become kind of a celebrity with Jesus' followers and an instant derelict with the religious leaders. One ancient tradition says that upon learning the Jewish leaders wanted to plot to kill him, Lazarus fled to France where he became the Bishop of Marseille and was later martyred. Another ancient tradition says that after Jesus' death, Lazarus, Mary, and Martha took a ship and went to Cyprus, where they lived, and Lazarus was later ordained by Paul and Barnabas as a bishop. That story says he lived to the ripe old age of 60 after living a quiet, hope-filled life. Are these stories true? No one really knows. 
But we do know that through all of it, nothing is impossible with God. And even when life is at its darkest moments, there is always hope. And dried up, parched, dead bones can live. Joan and Randall had quite an amazing love story. They were completely devoted to each other. And then Randall got sick. It was a long and painful illness, and I was with Randall as he took his last breath of earthly air, and I held Joan as her heart shattered and broke. I remember Joan telling me that her, she would never again find happiness or be able to live life without Randall. For months, Joan existed in a state of hopelessness, and each time I saw her, it was almost like I could hear her soul crying out, can these bones live? Well, fast forward a year or so, and I'm once again standing at the bedside of a dying person. This time, it is a woman named Kim who is dying well ahead of her time. As Kim took her final breath, I held her husband and two teenage sons and felt their hearts shatter and break. On the day of the memorial service, David, her husband, looked like a ghost. Broken and parched soul, and while he was trying to hard to smile and keep up for his boys, I could see that his eyes were dead and void of all hope. It was almost as if I could hear his soul crying out, can these bones live? So do you remember at the end of the Lazarus story how Jesus told the community to go and unbind, take off all those strips of cloth and let Lazarus go. Do you remember that part? Jesus did this so that the community could be participants in the miracle by touching him, by holding him and helping him to get rid of all that death and pain that was holding him so closely. And as I reflected on this story, David and Joan came to mind. For you see, in the subsequent years after each of their spouse's deaths, I watched David and Joan's church family walk with them, bit by bit, tearing off those pieces of the death cloth that bound them both so tightly. And with time, I saw life start coming back and being breathed in to their dry bones. Well, they were in the choir that used to sit behind me. And one day I was preaching along and just happened to glance back. And they were holding hands. Yeah. They never expected to be freed, to feel their dry bones come back to life and feel like living and loving again. The three of us cried tears of joy on the day I performed their wedding. Two broken, dead families had been freed from the life of pain that they'd been living and joined in and reborn into one new thriving family. Can these bones live? Why, yes. Yes, they can. So what I have to ask you today is what fear, cynicism, or death are you holding on to in your life? All of us have some, and I dare you that if you deny it, to really think about it. Because we all have that pain and death somewhere in our life. Just as Jesus breathed life into Lazarus and Mary and Martha and the community, he wants to do the same for you. And he wants to teach you that nothing is impossible for God. And there is always hope. Hope for healing either in this life or the next. We're not guaranteed when it will happen, but we are guaranteed that it will happen. You see, the enemy, 
he's going to try to trip you up. And he's going to bind you and hold you in those grave claws and make you believe that your hurt and your pain is for nothing. But don't you dare listen. Because Jesus still brings new life out of hopeless situations. So go to him and allow him to take all your pain and to breathe his resurrection breath back into your story. And then likewise, Jesus, just as he calls us to trust him and trust his timing in miracles, it means we also have to follow him and do what he says. We have to go out. We have to be participants in helping other people take off those clothes of death that bind them so tightly. This means holding people who need to be held, walking with people whose bones are so dry that we need to help hold them up, and loving them enough to help carefully unbind them from whatever kind of death is holding them so tight. Can these bones live? Why, yes. Yes, they can. One last thing is I was praying for the Spirit this week to speak to me and give me words to say today. An image was placed upon my heart. But you know what? It wasn't of a person with dry, parched bones, desperately seeking for new life, but a building. A building that was longing for the holy resurrection breath of Jesus to be born once again, to bring it back to life. You see, I learned about this building maybe a year or so ago. And a few years before that, it had fallen into a state of beginning to death and decay. And it wasn't that it wasn't loved. There just weren't enough people to help take care of it. But then, by the grace of God... A new community came and moved in and slowly began to unbind the grave cloths that held the building so tightly. The upper floor, which was once dark and cold, became filled with light and the color. The new inhabitants knew it would be a long journey, but they were faithful to the process so that hope and healing could become alive again in its walls. Well, guess what, my friends? Now joy graces the halls, the rooms, and the sanctuary. And beautiful souls are nourished by the love of Jesus through worship and fellowship. Hungry bodies are fed through grab-and-go meals. And people of all ages are growing in their faith through Bible studies, Club Luke, and youth group. Yes, my friends, it is this building. Our journey in this place is not complete. And there's still a, lot of whole work, a whole lot of work to do, both here and out there. But hope abounds in this place. If you listen, you can almost hear the building breathing. And if you listen even closer you might just hear the words, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Can these bones live? Say it with me. Yes. Yes, they can. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, sometimes this world sucks the life out of us. And sometimes our pain is so deep that we don't want to deal with it, so we shove it down year after year after year. All of us need resurrection breath somewhere in our lives. All of us need to be part of a miracle. So come to us. Come to us and breathe your holy breath upon us, healing us, so that we can go and take those grave cloths off other people. Empower us, Jesus. Breathe on us, breath of God. Amen.
is a time in our service where we pray with and for one another, lifting the joys and concerns of our life. Who has a joy for this week? I hoped you would, Peyton. I can always count on you. So we're like redoing the basement kind of, and we're going to make a little art area for me, and we're going to paint the wall white so I can paint um, different designs on it. Ooh, that sounds really fun. Maybe you need to come to my house and paint designs on my wall. That would be really cool. Right, Scott? Absolutely. <laughs> Allie. Um, I am thankful and joyful. My uh, little brother took my kids for the night on Friday night to get them out of the house and to give mom a little break. Um, and, but they got to go to the arcade and hang out with their really cool uncle. Um, and I was getting text messages at 12.30 in the morning from them. Hey, that's so, awesome. Oh, Peyton has another joy. Hold on. I got to see my baby cousin. All right, family. Judy, you got one? Yes, I do. This little story uh, might be a little embarrassing for some women, but I'm going to share it anyway. I've had breast cancer, and on Friday I had to go in for an annual mammogram. Not a lot of fun, not looking forward to it. Because in my case, I came in pretty skinny. Uh, not so much on the lower part, but on the upper part. And I was so skinny because about a year and a half ago, I lost about 30 pounds from a stay in the psychiatric ward at Central DuPage Hospital. It hadn't been the first time. And I was there because I very seriously was depressed and almost took my life. I came very close. But remembered I had a poem called Don't Quit in my dresser drawer. I went and got it and read it, and then I said, I don't think God would like this. I don't know why I said that, because I wasn't too sure about my position with God at, the, at that point. I was alone. I had called my psychotherapist and told him I thought I'd better go to the hospital. He said, I agree with that. Bruce, who was not home at the time, walked in the door, and I said, honey, I, I'd like to go to the hospital, where I stayed for three weeks, not making much progress. It was during COVID, and Bruce called me every day. He couldn't come to visit and said, I love you. Didn't mean a thing. Thing to me. I didn't care what he thought. I was in dire straits. So I had to have this mammogram. And I've always listened to my doctors because I have good ones. And I thought, okay, I've got to go through with this, but I was in pretty rough shape from the loss of all the weight. Like I say, my upper was little, and my lower was getting a little bit bigger because I do have a pretty good appetite, believe it or not. I was pushed and pulled. Those machines are cold and heavy, uncomfortable, and I said, to the technician, sexy, aren't I? And she laughed, and I thought, you know, she made, she made this fun for me. And I got through it. 
Bruce has often said, you know, we've got to die of something. But I'll say, I hope my time isn't up yet because I want to make sure I'm ready to go up, up there instead of down there. <laughs> So I hope God takes time with me because I'm not ready yet. I know that. But I'll do whatever it takes to stay here until it is time because I could stand to not understand when my therapist said, and I asked, what is suicide? And he said, it's all about you. And I thought, what does that mean? And then it dawned on me, I'm only thinking of myself. And then he said, Bruce said, it's very selfish. And I thought, oh boy. And then the psychotherapist really said it. It would devastate your son and your husband. And I thought, I can't do that to them. God has been too good to me. And for, for me to even say that means I must be beginning to believe. I hope that gives all of you a little hope when you have to do something that you don't want to. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. I have that poem, Don't Quit, in my Bible. Who said that? Oh, I did, the one who you got your back turned to. <laughs> I have that poem in my Bible. Does anybody else, uh, Cindy, you want to share a joy for us? I have one. Okay, Bruce, then Cindy. I have a joy, uh, a harbinger of spring. Uh, this week I heard and saw maybe a hundred sandhill cranes Ooh. in the sky and uh, make, making their way back to Canada for the season. So always a happy thing to see. That is. All right, Cindy. Well, that's a happy thing. I talked to Robert, our custodian, this morning, and he's got a new grandbaby on the way. And he said, okay, I've got six girls. I need a boy. <laughs> is anybody, uh, is, do you have your hand up, Maddie? Okay. Um. It, I have two of them. Um, it's finally spring break, and so I'm happy that it'll start looking nice outside. And um, the second one is thank you for all the prayers for my friend Hannah. She's coming back to school after spring break. Um, they diagnosed what was wrong with her, and she's feeling a lot better. Praise God. Do we have, Chuck. Alice, you're getting your steps in today. I have a joy and a concern. I'll put them all together here. Okay. My joy is that uh, my son and his wife and my granddaughter from California and my daughter and son-in-law from Kentucky both came up to see me last week at the same time. So it was just a wonderful time. Uh, Last uh, Thursday, I couldn't join the guys because I went to a uh, celebration of life. A friend of mine lost her daughter. Oh, sorry. She was 49 years old. Uh, she had two children. The youngest was 16. And uh, she had brain cancer and had surgery. And then it went into her lungs. And What was her name, Chuck? Her name, uh, her name was Jennifer. So prayers for the family. Thank you. Anybody else?
Any other concerns? We'll move to concerns. Ali? Just continued prayers for my kids as we're still going through transitions and, um, you know, just redoing the house now, getting to make it our space. And we have a joy that you are learning how to use power tools. I am. And a concern that you're learning how to use power tools. That is also a concern tools. I've never used when I bought my first drill, and it is pink. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let us go to God in prayer. Lord, we come to you today as a family of faith, united in person, but also across screens. By your love and we lift our prayers to you as we struggle with all the scary news that changes minute by minute the political wranglings that cause divisiveness rather than unity devastating natural disasters violence committed daily against the innocent let alone the path of broken relationships and loss we pray for your resurrection power for peace healing and hope the kind of peace in which we celebrate diversity and the type of healing that brings hope to a world that feels so often dead and broken. Help us to become those who are blessed to tear off the grave clothes of suffering for other people and bring your new life to all who need it. Lord, today as we pray for your people, we thank you for all the joys you have heard coming from the congregation, for new opportunities to be creative and redo basements for family that steps in and brings new experiences and so much love for spring break for a good friend getting feeling much better for poems that say don't quit and for your beautiful wildlife like a sandhill crane that reminds us that seasons and new life are coming lord we thank you that with you there is always hope May we never forget that simply waking up each morning and being able to live for you is a joy to be celebrated and open our eyes to the many miracles of life that we so often miss. Lord, we pray for the people of this world, for those who are hungry. May we stop and take notice, sacrificing our own indulgent lives for theirs. For young children who are facing abuse and neglect, open our eyes to reach out and help them. And for all who are struggling with life, whether it be challenging situations or illness of any kind, we ask for your comfort and hope. Today we lift to you all who are hoping for good medical resorts, results. And we just pray that your steadfast love will continue to be with Allie and Emily and Aiden and Peyton. May your light guide them each step of the day, and may they feel your heart beating next to theirs. Bring healing to all who need it, according to your will, and comfort in their pain. Lord, we also lift to you all who grieve. We lift to you all who were injured or killed in those devastating tornadoes that ripped across Mississippi and Alabama. We pray for those who face painful reminders of death that still holds so much sting. And we pray for Jennifer's family and all who loved her. May the peace of the resurrection that surpasses all understanding fill their hearts. And may they feel enveloped in your arms of love. Finally, Jesus, we pray for your church. Fill us with your spirit. Empower us to continue to use your holy breath to breathe new life into dried out bones, not only in this place, but in our community. Dare us to become more than we ever dreamed we could bring and bring us new people who need you. Inspire us to give more of ourselves and all that we have and above all, challenge us to love with a heart like yours. We pray these things in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray until he returns. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever One phrase that I learned a long, long time ago in ministry, and it's one phrase you'll probably hear me say a lot, 
is little is much when placed in the hands of God. So often we think that, oh, I only have a little money to give, so I'm not going to give. Or I only have a little bit of time to give, so I'm not going to offer my time. But when in reality, when we put all that together, great things can happen and new life can be breathed into old, old bones, whether they're made of wood and brick or flesh and blood. So I challenge you, what will you give Jesus this week? If it is a financial, no, I can't speak, a financial donation to this church, to the glory of God, to further our ministries, feel free to leave it in the plate on the back pew. You can give through the QR code on the back of the bulletin, or you can give online. Or if it is your time, let one of our elders or deacons know that you are willing to say yes. I'll give what I can because it's going to multiply in the hands of God. Whatever it is, remember, little is much when placed in the hands of God. Let us pray. Lord, so often we want what is big, but we think small. We think we don't have anything to offer, or that what we have to offer isn't good enough. So forgive us for our small thinking, and take all that we have, and multiply it in your hands as only you can do. We offer all that we have and all that we are to you, Jesus. Amen.
blood come out. Stephanie, come out. Chuck, come out. Allie, come out. That is what Jesus is calling to each and every one of us today. Listen for his resurrection breath and feel his hope. Go into your day today and may the living Lord go with you, above you to watch over you, beside you to befriend you, behind you to encourage you, within you to give you the gifts of faith, hope, and love, and as always ahead of you to guide you on your way. Go in peace. Thank you.